Okay, well, as you see the title, multi-agent reinforcement learning and some new methods roll out in policy iteration. Yes. And, uh, okay, so this is from material that came, that uh, is included in my research monograph that was published uh, a couple of months ago and that was based on uh, on the course that I gave at ASU in the winter semester, in the spring semester. And uh, uh, there is, uh, okay, you can find literature on, about, uh, about this research on, um, at my website. There's an overview paper that's about to be published. And uh, it's based on several research papers that appeared on ArcGIV over the next year. And uh, there is, one paper that was just finished and will be up off the internet in a few days, uh, co-authored by Shushmita Bhattacharya, Shiva Kailas, Sahil Badial, and Stephanie Gill. Uh, we have also published another paper, uh, with one exception, Shiva was not a co-author, but another student was a co-author, Thomas Wheeler, and that deals with related topics, and I'll explain where that comes in, but uh, uh, this is the second paper that we uh, published on uh, a challenging multi-agent, multi-robot uh, repair problem that involves partial uh, observations. And, um, and this is, uh, it gives uh, implementations and variations of the techniques that I'm going to talk now. It's a very challenging problem and we are uh, pleased to, we were pleased to see favorable results. So, um, here's my outline. I'm going to talk about multi-agent problems in general. Different people mean different things with multi-agents, so I'm going to be careful in explaining exactly what I'm referring to. Uh, the kind of multi-agent problems that I'm going to be discussing are addressable by dynamic programming, the classical technique of dynamic programming. However, we're going to introduce a different way of doing the classical method of policy iteration which is going to be agent by agent. Uh, there are multiple agents, and uh, instead of all of them choosing simultaneously their decisions, uh, they go one at a time, agent by agent, with intermediate communication of the decisions. Uh, then I'm going to discuss the exact, the properties of exact policy direction of this policy improvement, and then talk about approximate versions of policy direction that use neural networks or architecture for construction architectures, value networks and or policy networks. Then I'm going to talk about a further attempt at parallelization through autonomous multi-agent rollout where the agents do not communicate, but they have some kind of pre-computed coordination uh, policies. And then I'm going to discuss uh, uh, the multi-robot re uh, repair problem, the five author multi Robot repair problem, uh, and uh, and I have some videos that uh, uh, Shushmita prepared, and uh, and uh, uh, I think they're very revealing about what's happening. So, uh, about multi-agent problems, it is a very old field and very well researched. And generally, it refers to a setup where you have uh, decision centers, these agents here. Each agent has its own decision variable. Uh, and, uh, and they exchange information with each other. And they exchange information with uh, the environment. And they receive also information from the environment through sensors. And uh, so they collect this information, they share some of this information selectively with each other. And the uh, ith agent applies decision UI sequentially in discrete time. So we're dealing with discrete time systems here where the agents at time zero apply some decisions, then a state of the system evolves, uh, some information is exchanged, a new decision at time one, at time two, and so on, going for a finite number of steps, time steps for an infinite horizon. Okay, now this picture here represents a very, very wide class of 
problems. And the first major distinction between problem structures, uh, which was well known at the, in the beginning of the field, but now it tends to be overlooked, is that there, is, there are two types of problems. Ones that have the classical information pattern, where the agents are fully cooperative. They have the same objective and they fully share their information. So even though they may be getting their information from different places, they communicate with each other and they all act when they choose their decisions. They have exactly the same information. Now, this case is quote unquote easy uh, because it can be treated in principle by dynamic programming. And dynamic programming is a solid algorithm with very well developed theory. It's very good to have it uh, uh, to have it working for you. The difficult case is the non-classical information pattern, which where the agents may be antagonistic, they may have different objectives, and they are also partially sharing information. So they have local information that they don't share, perhaps. And this problem is hard, very hard because it cannot be treated by dynamic programming. And just to emphasize this point, let me tell you that when I was a PhD student, I actually worked on this problem for about six months. That was 50 years ago, okay? And, uh, and uh, at that time, it was a popular subject. It was not called multi-agent problem, it was called decentralized control, or team theory, things like that. And uh, uh, people were very much aware of this distinction. Nobody was, was working on the classical information pattern because after all, this was dynamic programming. So people just didn't pay attention to this as much. The emphasis was on non-classical information pattern and that's what I worked on also. But after six months, I realized how hard this problem was and I figured out that I'm never going to publish a strong result in this area. And I did not regret it, actually, that I changed my field. The field went on strong for about 10 years or so, like around 1980. And then people really got discouraged. The field was going nowhere, really. And there were interesting theoretical, mathematical results, but nothing that could be, could be used, particularly with the computers that were available in those days. So the field went dormant for like 25 years until the reinforcement learning came along. About 15 years ago, people in the reinforcement learning started bringing their own brand of uh, analysis and methodology to this problem. And uh, yes, the problem is hard, but for reinforcement learning people, nothing is hard, okay? So they just uh, kept at it. So now I'm going to start with this classical information pattern problem. And we will generalize a little bit as we go along. Now, remember, the classical information pattern problem is everybody is cooperative with everybody else. Everybody knows whatever everybody else knows. So you can simplify conceptually the, the system as having some kind of a cloud. The cloud collects all the information, computes the state of the system, at least what is important for the agents to know, and then sends it back to the agents who choose their decisions based on some policies that they have. So at each time, the agents have exact state information conceptually provided by some cloud. It doesn't have to be practiced that way, but it's conceptually useful to think of it that way. And they choose their controls as functions of this state information. So, we can construct a mathematical model, which involves a discrete time, possibly stochastic system, with state a vector x, which can live in any space, in an arbitrary space. And a control u, which however has m components. Now this is a structure that we really want to focus on. The control has, is a vector of m components. And for this talk, the components take values in a finite set. There's a finite number of alternatives for each of these U1 up to UM.
that's the only structure here that differentiates this problem from regular dynamic programming problems. And agents is actually just a metaphor. The important structure is just the multi-component decision. And uh, now the components may be chosen by multiple robots, but they could also be, be associated with the different arms of a single robot. This could be a single robot that has multiple arms. And uh, the, the, the motion of each arm is, uh, is described by these variables, the corresponding U variables here. The theoretical framework is dynamic programming. And the initial aim here is faster computation. The computation here is quite daunting because there may be several agents and each one. So the search space is enormous here. And we will aim to deal with that search space uh, 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 difficult computation. So we will deal with the exponential size of the search and control space. Uh, and also, We'll try to do something else in addition. Uh, these agents have to pick their controls at each time, and it would be nice if they could pick them in parallel rather than in sequence, so that we get some parallelization speed up. And uh, so we're going to see ways to do that. And uh, in the process, we're going to make a connection with non-classical information pattern issues. But we're going to start from an easy problem, and we're just going to have a simple objective, just make the computation fast. Okay, so let me give you an example. Okay, so this is representative of, uh, of uh, a very large class of uh, problems. Uh, Multi-robot delivery problems, multi-robot maintenance and repair problems, search and rescue, firefighting. And what we have here, is uh, I have tried to make my loop more interesting by, 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 by making the decision makers be spiders, whose objective is to catch flies within some space. So here we have 15 spiders. They move in the four directions, up, down, right, left, plus they can stay in the same place with perfect vision. The, the spiders see each other perfectly well, and they also see the flies, and they want to catch the flies. Now, the flies are passive. They're just uh, blind. They don't see the spiders at all. And moreover, they don't try to do anything purposefully. They just move randomly. So what we want is to move somehow in an intelligent way the spiders towards uh, the flies and sort of surround the flies so that they don't escape. And we want to catch them in minimum time. Now, what are the controls here? The controls are the controls are the vector of uh, joint motions of the of the of the spiders. So, uh, the number of possible joint moves is five to the fifteen. Okay, it's a little less than that, but about five to the fifteen. Because there are five fifteen, fifteen spiders, and they have five choices each. Now, in our methodology, we are going to reduce this to five times 15, just 75 choices, while maintaining good properties of the algorithm. We're going to do it in a special way so that even though we dramatically are going to reduce the number of choices and make the computation feasible, we're still going to maintain some good properties of the algorithm. And the idea is the following, break down the control into a sequence of one spider at a time moves. So let's say the first spider makes a move, then broadcasts the move to all other spiders. The second spider makes a move, broadcasts its move, and so on. So there is a sequential choice and coordination between the, the spiders by telling the other spiders what they have done. So that's the trick here. And uh, now, one of the problems of this method of this approach is that we, the spiders have to make moves in sequence, one at a time. And uh, this is a serial operation. It's a serial computation. So what we want to do is parallelize this computation by introducing 
pre-computed coordination between the spiders so that the spiders will choose moves in parallel rather than in sequence. And that's an extra speed up, speed up factor of 15. It could be significant. OK, so this is just an example of which I'm going to come back again a little later. And uh, now let me discuss the non-classical information pattern approach just in the way of setting a historical framework to this problem. In the old days, the word multi-agent was not used. The terms used were team theory, which actually came from economics, the field originating in economics, actually. And they, and they had the, the name team theory. In control, people used the name decentralized control. Now, in the reinforcement learning, starting in the 15 years ago or so, or 20 years ago, the names decentralized Markovian decision problems were used uh, and decentralized POMDP, or sometimes they call it DEC POMDP or DEC MDP. Okay, so that's a, thing, a term that you'll find in the, in the literature. And there's a lot of literature uh, and it's, it's accelerating over the last 15, 20 years. It's a lot of literature. Now, these problems are really the same. They, they are not really different. They're just different names. Uh, they are dynamic uh, and the agents have uh, uh, common goals. In this team theory, the agents act as a team. They have the same objective function, but they do not fully share information. So we have a non-classical information pattern. So in the context of spiders and flies, think of a situation where the spiders can see some of the flies, like the neighboring flies, uh, some of the flies, but they cannot see the others, or they can see some of the other spiders, but not all of them. Now, once you cross the threshold from non -cla from classical information pattern to classical information pattern, the problem becomes very difficult. And the, there's been a lot of papers, but few results really over, over 50 years now, 50, 60 years. And uh, let me mention uh, a lot of literature literature that tries to exploit weak couplings between the agents. So the idea is that some of the agents are not close to each other. They don't, they don't affect each other's choices. So you can just neglect the fact that, uh, that neglect their information and, uh, and act as if uh, they were not there. Okay. And uh, one can prove various results along this line. And that has been a, 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 a significant research direction. Okay, now we're still in the 70s, 80s here. Uh, the approach that was taken by reinforcement learning people uh, was based on the, for the most part, the policy gradient method. So the RL people said, well, let's forget about the dynamic programming, it doesn't apply. We are going to parameterize the agent policies in a way that is consistent with the information that they receive. And then we're going to tune the parameters. So these policies, the way how they act is parameterized by the parameters of a neural network, let's say. Uh, and then we tune the parameters by using methods that we know and love, like gradient descent. And uh, this, has, this is the basis of uh, a very broad class, a very popular class of reinforcement learning called policy gradient methods. Now, policy gradient methods are general optimization methods. They include also, sometimes they are related also to random search methods. They do not need the dynamic program instruction, and so they are very general. At the same time, they have weaknesses that the dynamic programming methods do not have. One of the advantages is that being very general, they can deal with non-classical information patterns. This advantage is that these are strictly offline methods. They have to, you have to train some neural networks uh, to, uh, to, to, to get this, this policies, this parameterized policies. And that takes, uh, this is offline training. And the training is difficult. Uh, people tend to minimize how difficult it is to make these methods work. I can tell you it's very difficult. And uh, moreover, these methods, once you have trained a neural network, you're stuck with that neural network. The neural network cannot adapt to online changes of the problem data. 
sometimes, okay, new flies may come in. Okay, the neural network hasn't predicted that. So it cannot do replanning, online replanning. The theory that's uh, involving these methods, the policy gradient methods, is not very solid. Okay, there are kind of general and vague guarantees about convergence to a local minimum uh, by the gradient descent method, but okay, so this is, uh, this is not very satisfying and very reassuring. So my experience with this policy gradient methods within this context is not very good. And I personally feel that uh, there's a lot of more work uh, to be done. And in fact, it may be an overall flawed approach. We just don't know that at this point. OK, so all of this is to set the, the framework for what we're going to discuss. And now let me give you the dynamic programming formulation, assuming the perfect information pattern. So what we have is a dynamic system that has a state, which I generally denote by X, and has a control that I generally denote by U. And the control now has M components corresponding to different agents. And the state of the system evolves according to some discrete time equation. From the current state, you apply the current control, and there's something random. This W is random, some random element. And you get the next state, XK plus 1. So from x0, you get x1, x2, and so on. And each time there's a transition, say from xk to xk plus 1, there is a cost, which is random because it depends on this wk, depends on the current state, depends on the control that you apply. And there's also a discount factor, alpha to the k. Alpha is something that's between 0 and 1. So it uh, sort of uh, discounts the cost. And cost of stages far into the future do not count as much. So now the what we want to find here is a policy. Knowing the state, we want to apply a control. And the control has m components. So a policy is a function that has m components that maps the current state into the control component of the ith agent, OK, to mu i of x. This, is, uh, this is, belongs to some constraint set. And, uh, there is one such function for each agent. And I'm using the term agent here in a loose manner, just, uh, just a, as a conceptual metaphor. So we know the state. We look at the state. Each agent applies controls according to a policy. And there's a cost that's generated that depends on our choices of control, the current state, and the random uh, element. and uh, now, we accumulate these costs over an infinite horizon uh, in this formulation. There's a finite horizon version of this problem, but we're going to focus on this infinite horizon problem. Uh, and, uh, OK, the cost accumulated over, over a, a finite number of stages, let's say capital N stages, is a random variable because of the presence of this W. We take the expected value of that. And we take the limit as the horizon goes to infinity. And that gives us a number. This number is the cost of the policy, the current this policy mu here, as a function of the initial state. So this is a function. And the optimal cost function is obtained by minimizing overall policies. OK. So um, a mu that attains the minimum here is an optimal policy. And, uh, and this theory about existence of optimal policies, uniqueness, uh, optimality conditions, and so on. And the most important optimality condition is what you see here. This is called Bellman's equation, the most fundamental equation in the dynamic programming. And it says that to obtain an optimal policy, what you have to do is minimize over all possible controls the cost of the first stage, the immediate stage, plus the cost of the future stages, assuming that we act optimally. J star is the optimal cost function. So this is the state at which we are going to land when we are at x and apply this control. And we 
we evaluate future costs as the optimal cost from the next day. Of course, this is all a random variable. We take the expected value and we minimize over all, all control vectors here, over all the agents joined here. Now, okay, so this is a very nice definitive result. Uh, it's holds just about just about every dynamic programming mod model. But there is a problem. The problem is that we don't know this J star. It's very hard to find, extremely hard to find. Uh, there's a second problem here that the minimization is over potentially a very large space. So that may be a difficulty, but the, the key difficulty, and in fact, the reason why we have reinforcement learning is that J star is very hard to find. And a very broad, uh, very broad, broad collection of reinforcement learning methods that replaces J star by some approximation, perhaps some kind of a neural network approximation, perhaps some other approximation, but it tries to cut corners by replacing the optimal J star with some approximation. By the way, you may interrupt me anytime, ask questions, very informal here. Okay, now in dynamic programming, there's a fundamental algorithm, uh, the policy iteration algorithm. We want to find an optimal policy. So we take an initial guess, and then we try to improve this policy and improve it and improve it and improve it until hopefully we get to the optimal. So here is a schematic illustration of policy iteration. You start with some policy, which I'll be referring to as the base policy, mu. Then you do two things. You first evaluate this policy by finding its cost function. Now, how do you do that? Okay, suppose that you can do it in some way. Let's not get into that, perhaps by simulation, perhaps in some other way. And you, having found J nu, you do a policy improvement, an operation that produces a new policy, which according the rollout policy. Now, the way you do it is by means of this equation. What we do here is we have J nu, the base policy, gives, gives us through policy evaluation this function of mu. And we minimize, like in Bellman's equation, except that we use J mu, which we can calculate somehow, uh, rather than J star, which is almost impossible to calculate for a challenging problem. So we make an approximation here, replacing J star with J mu to obtain from a base policy, a rollout policy. And now there's a magical property which underlies a lot of reinforcement learning, the pol policy improvement property, that the new policy is a better policy has a smaller cost for every initial state, uniformly. OK, so now what is the rollout algorithm? The rollout algorithm is a one-time policy iteration. We just do this once. We have a base policy, and we obtain the rollout policy, and then we use the rollout policy. That's all there is to it. It can be implemented online if the values of J nu are available, perhaps approximately, through simulation, perhaps with a trained neural network. I'll allude to these details a little bit more. And uh, a second major advantage of the rollout algorithm is uh, robustness. If you implement it online, it can adapt to variations in the problem data. In other words, when you do a policy evaluation, the problem data changes, you can take that into account. Similarly, if the cost function changes, you can take that into account. And even though the policy is the same, the rollout policy is adapted to the variations of, um, of, uh, of the problem data. OK, so now rollout is just one iteration. Policy iteration is simply repeated rollout. You do one rollout, get new tilde, you use it as a base policy to obtain a new rollout, and then a new rollout, and a new rollout, 
and you continue to improve this cost function. And you can prove also under the proper conditions, you can prove convergence to the exact optimal. Remember, everything is done exactly here. And you can show that this policy improvement property uh, holds uh, and uh, uh, holds, ex holds uh, uh, in its exact form and also gives you the optimal policy in the limit. Okay. Dimitri, I have a question. Yeah. So you're taking an, an expectation here, right? In this formula where you define mu tilde. Is, that's the expected value of G, blah, 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 plus alpha J mu, right? Is expectation yeah. over what? Expectation over W, okay? Oh, okay, yeah, okay, all right, okay. W yes. is a random, has given distribution. Yes. Yeah, 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 I forgot about and, uh, that, that's fine. And in some cases, you can calculate this expectation fully. In other mm -hmm. cases, you, you need to use Just a simulator or a computer model to, to okay. where you implement this randomness in the computer model. Okay, okay. That's, that's good. That's fine. Sorry. Okay, fine. Okay, so now here's what we're, we're going to do. We'll take this policy duration method and we're going to change it by introducing a new form of policy improvement, namely one agent at a time minimization, one agent at a, agent at a time policy improvement. And multi-agent rollout is going to be just a single iteration version of this policy duration, but it can be implemented online and it does have the robustness property that I mentioned earlier. And now we're going to make an attempt to venture into the non-classical information pattern area where we're missing some information relative to the classical information pattern, but we use guesses, okay? Intelligent guesses, estimators, to estimate the mis missing information. And these guesses are pre-computed, possibly using neural network training. And so that's the way neural networks can be brought in to change a problem of a non-classical information pattern to an almost classical information pattern. That's a different approach that has been used in the past. And uh, there's a tremendous potential for future research in this area. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a subject of ongoing research by us and I'm sure others. Okay, so that's all I want to say in the way of introduction. And I don't have a, let me take a look at my clock here. Oh my God, I'm not doing so well. Let me, uh, let me go now into the specifics. Uh, what do we mean by this agent by agent policy improvement? Remember that the standard rollout algorithm minimizes in this expression of Bellman's equation, but with the cost of the policy, the base policy being in place of J star. And the problem is that it has a search space with size that's exponentially in M, right? Now, this is, can become prohibitive for many problems. You, just the, the search space grows so quickly that with just uh, a few agents, three, four, five agents, you're already uh, in never, never land. So our alternative, this multi-agent rollout algorithm does this minimization one agent at a time. So we have an order of the agents from one going to N. We first compute the rollout control of the first agent by minimizing over just this control while fixing all the other controls at their base policy values, okay? Then we go to the second agent. And the second agent does this minimization over its own control, assuming that future agents are going to be using the base policy, but the preceding agent will use the policy just computed. And we keep going. Every agent does minimization over its own control after the preceding agents have considered, have computed their own controls and the future agents are assumed to be using their, uh, their base uh, policy controls. And we go all the way down to the last agent. And now the search space of all this 
is linear, you know, instead of exponential, it became linear. It's a very dramatic uh, speed up, very dramatic improvement. So the question is, if you're cutting so much corner, so many corners, uh, what are you losing here? It turns out that we don't lose all that much, apparently. So let me get into that. So that's the basic thing. That's the, that's the key to all this methodology. Uh, making the choices of the agents one at a time. Uh, with the spiders, for example, the spiders and flies contact, choosing their moves one at a time, broadcasting to the other spiders, and so on. It turns out that there is theory to all this, and this theory is very old. Uh, it's 25 years old. It, there's a whole section in my neurodynamic programming book that I wrote in 1996 with John Cicliss about how you can simplify the control space at the expense of making the state space more complex. And the idea is the following. We introduce a different but equivalent problem where every transition from state xk to state xk plus one is broken down into a sequence of small transitions with each transition involving just a single component of the control. So here we just choose u1 and then we choose u2, but knowing the current state and u1 that we chose. And keep going, use the previous choices as the basis for calculating the new control. And finally, at the last leg of these M transitions, you move into the new state according to this equation and uh, incurring the cost. So we unfold the control space into its end components and we apply them sequentially. And this problem is just equivalent, has the same cost function as the original one. And uh, the control space is simplified because each time we choose, we have just one control to choose over. However, there are additional layers of states. So the state space has become more complicated and here the state is xk, here it involves one control, two controls, and minus one controls. So the cost functions have increased from one cost function, j of xk, we have this additional cost functions here. Uh, so we have an increase by a factor of n. But the magical thing is that, uh, okay, so having introduced this reformulation, Multi-agent rollout, as I described in the previous slide, is just the same as standard rollout for this reformulated problem. There's no new theory really here. We just reformulate the problem and you will just use standard rollout on a reformulated but equivalent problem. On the other hand, the increase in the size of the state space, all of these extra functions, does not adverse, adversely affect the computations of rollout because rollout cares only about the current state, does not care what happens in other states, it just moves from one state to another. Uh, if you look at the algorithm a little closer, you'll see that even though the state space is far more complicated, it doesn't bother us at all. And the key theoretical fact is that the cost improvement property is maintained. Why is that? Because what we're doing is just standard rollout for this equivalent problem. Therefore, we improve the cost. It takes only a few minutes to, to see it. And you can also uh, prove this cost improvement property by uh, through analysis, through sort of uh, a detailed analysis. So we have maintained the cost improvement property, but we have reduced the complexity from n to the m to n times n, where n is the number of possible choices for each component. So now I want to show how this works uh, with uh, some videos. And I hope they work, but I'm glad we have Shushmita here. If I can't show the video, she's going to take care, care, of, it, care of the videos. Uh, I started using videos in my, in my in my talks just this year, okay? 
I was strictly a paper and pencil type of person. But uh, I really like them because they are very insightful. So what we're going to have here, what I'm going to show you, is a problem involving four spiders and two flies. The flies move randomly, they're blind, and the, and the spiders try to catch the flies in any time. And we need to define a base policy. And the base policy is a greedy policy. It moves the spiders along the shortest path to the closest surviving fly. In other words, a spider does not care about what the other spiders does. Looks around to the flies, finds the one that's closest in terms of the Manhattan distance, because it's going to be on the grid, and then moves along the shortest path. And, OK, so let's see. Now, in the greedy policy, the, the, the spiders have no coordination. So here is the initial condition. They're bunched together. The four spiders are bunched together. And the two flies are here. But uh, these guys. Dimitri, Dimitri if, if we're supposed to see spiders and flies on the slides, I can't see anything. Really? Yeah. Can you guys see? No. I just see four squares. One says base policy, greedy. The other one says standard rollout all at once. But I don't see any spider or flies. Uh, can you click on the text of? Uh... Okay, I'm going to click on this text here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it not opening up? Uh, it comes out for me, but not okay, for you. Can, can he you, sees uh, it. Yeah, I think uh, Zoom is only uh, taking your presentation screen. So can you switch your screen, like um, all tab, try all tab. I go to a different screen. Go to okay. What I'm going to do? The, the problem is that quick, quick time. so okay, Dimitri, the problem is that Zoom is specifically sharing your slides. So it even though you can see the video, Zoom okay. isn't sharing it. Okay. Um, so so if you start a new screen sharing, but for the, it'll give you an option to choose the video this time. Um, right. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Okay. And now I'm going to do a new share. With your full desktop, I think. So if you do that. Okay. See now? Yes. Okay. Okay, guys. This is a little bit primitive, but, uh, but uh, we're going to keep, uh, keep uh, plugging away. Okay, so we have the four spiders here, and they try to catch the flies, and they're selfish, okay? They, and they don't coordinate. So they are going to go to the close surviving fly, and they all do the same thing. So you expect them to move together. The intelligent thing to do would be for the spiders to split off. Two of them go this way, and two of them go that way. And moreover, because the, fly, the, spy, the flies move randomly, You'd like to see them sort of try to encircle the encircle the uh, the, uh, the the flies. Okay, so let's see what uh, this base policy will do. Okay, so you can see them moving, right? And uh, okay, two of the spiders prefer the horizontal uh, in the Manhattan distance metric, and in the case of a tie, and two of them prefer the vertical. So that's why you see them. Uh, you see them. Okay, so all four of them zeroed in on the first fly and caught it. And now, having done that, they go to the other fly, which moves randomly. And uh, okay, so they're going to go like this, and it's going to take a long time. So I'm going to pause the video here. Okay, I'm going to stop it. Eventually, they're going to catch it, but uh, they're going to take. 85 moves. Okay, I'm going to show you the results at the end. Now, for the moment, I don't want to. Well, I want to lose my shared screen. Screen. Uh, I'm going to go into. Let's see, I'm going to. Dimitri, if you oh. try to share your entire desktop, that would be the best, I think. So there is an option that says, like you do, go share screen and says desktop. If you can share the entire desktop, like everything that you see on your computer is probably the best for us, I think. Okay, I understand what you're saying, um, except I can't find the button, okay? 
um, okay, I see the share screen button, the green button at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what should I do next? So I think it comes Just, next screen. A click on the share screen. Okay. So then now I have the all these windows. Yeah, one of the options should be desktop. I think that's what it says, right? Yeah, it says desktop, right, yeah. Then click on that one. Ah, terrific. No, but still not showing, yeah? Oh. Uh, I think it's... Yeah, I think it's fine now. I think mm. you just need to start the video now. We should be oh, able okay. to see. Okay, if he clicks. Okay. okay. Click so on I'm going to show video. you the standard rollout and see if it's more yeah. intelligent than this greedy. Oh, yeah. you yes. see? Yes. Good, now great, all right. <laughs> okay. Okay, now you see that the rollout has vision into the future, has implicit coordination. So the, fly, the spiders split off and they go towards the two different flies. And also, if you watch a little carefully, you see that they're trying to encircle the fly. They go on different, from different sides. And uh, so I'm going to... Now, this was the standard rollout all, all at once, the one that has the high complexity. Now, this is the simpler, uh, the agent by agent, and it does roughly the same thing. It doesn't do something, anything radically different. You see them, the spider splitting off and also uh, encircling, try to encircle the, uh, the flies. And this is all because there is this implicit coordination. They tell each other what they are doing. So to give you the results here, Okay, so for the base policy, the shortest path policy, the capture time was long, 85. For the standard or not, it took 35 units, 34 units to capture the flies. However, the computation done at each move, they had to select between 625 uh, choices. And the agent by agent got the same result, but with only 20 move choices, 20 calculations per move, okay? So a significant gain. Okay, so to, to recap all this, uh, comparing standard with multi-agent rollout and policy narration. They produce uh, different rollout policies. They're not the same policy that they produce. And one may produce a better policy than the other. On the other hand, the standard rollout requires intractable computation for even a moder modest number of uh, agents. Uh, even with four, four spiders, four agents, we saw significant difference. And our speculation, and indeed it's based on a lot of computations that we have done in a few contexts, including the pipeline repair context, uh, agent by agent rollout will overperform over about as well as standard rollout. There's not much difference between the two but a tremendous gain on the computational overhead. Now let's turn to policy duration. That is repeated rollout. And we use repeatedly this agent by agent policy improvement. There is a theoretical result that you can prove here. You can show a convergence result to a policy that's not optimal, but it involves a different kind of optimality known as agent by agent optimality. Now, this concept was very important in team theory. Remember, I talked about team theory from the 60s. At that time, people were talking about person by person optimality, team member by team member optimality, whereby a policy like that is one where each agent's choice is optimal, assuming all the other agents are going to stay at their choices. Okay? So, Assuming that nobody moves, the move of every one agent is optimal. And, uh, and there's a convergence result with the agent by agent policy duration converges in a finite number of durations to an agent by agent optimal policy. And the rate of convergence seems comparable with standard policy duration. So there's some loss here, but uh, hopefully it's not too much uh, in terms of uh, uh, results. There's also another convergence result that's stronger, but requires more computation. Let me not go into that. Okay, so all of this was exact, exact policy duration. Now I'm going to say how you go, you do approximations. And 
you have again the same policy duration diagram from a base policy we evaluated but approximately using some kind of a network a neural network for, for example uh, or some other computation and then the this generates uh, policy data you can get training data involving involving data points of the, the, the policies choices and you can use that to train another neural network that provides a representation of this rollout policy not the same rollout policy but an approximation a neural network representation so now we're going to get an approximate rollout policy which has a, a policy improvement property that's approximate in other words the policy improvement holds within some epsilon and epsilon is very complicated and you can calculate in some cases but not in others so but the important thing that in practice it does work reasonably well provided of course that you do all this training here properly now if you do a single policy duration this is approximate rollout just start from a base policy get a new uh, policy that's approximately improved uh, on the other hand, if you want to do multiple policy iterations, then there's no way to do it without doing offline training with neural networks. So that detracts from the, uh, of the attractiveness of multiple policy iterations. However, I should point out that many reinforcement learning algorithms have implemented schemes like that, including AlphaZero. The famous AlphaZero program does precisely this. It does offline policy iteration with value networks and policy networks, deep neural networks, okay? And then uses online rollout for the result of the offline policy iteration. Use the result of the offline policy iteration as base policy for online rollout. And I should correct that. AlphaGo uses online rollout. The Alpha Zero, the latest program, does not use rollout basically because it uses such a such a long look ahead, multi-step look ahead that rollout is not really uh, uh, essential. So that's how you introduce approximations into the picture. And uh, now let me. Let me go through this idea of parallelization of the agent choices. Okay. One agent at a time policy improvement is uh, an inherently serial computation. And the question is, how can we parallelize it? And we use something that I'll call pre computed signaling. The obstacle to parallelization is that to compute the cave agent rollout control we need the rollout controls of the preceding agents. So the computation is serial. The first has to compute before the second one starts. And the second one has to compute before the third one starts and so on. So the way we can remedy this is by using pre-computed guesses, substitute guesses in place of the preceding rollout controls. And in this way, we lose something in performance, but we hope that uh, the cost improvement property will be, will be, to a significant extent, be maintained. And what can you use for signaling these guesses? We can use the base policy controls. That's uh, readily available, but it turns out that this may not be a good idea, and I'll show you why. Um, the other possibility is to to offline represent the rollout policy using a neural network. And you use the neural network outputs for signaling. And this requires offline computation. And there are also other choices. We tried in the paper with uh, uh, the five author paper, we tried several different uh, uh, possibilities. And uh, I think the computational results are quite revealing. So, okay. 
I'm going to go quickly through this, and then I'm going to go into the multi-agent uh, robot problem. Here, the problem with using the base policy for signaling is that it lacks coordination capability. Uh, and, uh, and so if you have a, a, a simple problem of two spiders and two flies on the line, if the spiders are separated, then uh, everything works fine, in fact, optimally. However, if the spiders start at the same point, uh, each one thinks that the other one is going to go to the closest uh, fly and then goes in the opposite direction. But they are uncoordinated, so they all think the same way and they just go back and forth and they never catch the flies. So, I can explain this more, but instead of doing so, I'm going to go into the multi-robot repair problem where we're going to see something similar. Okay, so this is the paper that we are about to post uh, on the internet. Uh, and uh, most of our computations involve this network of 32 sites that are susceptible to damage, okay? They have different degrees of damage. And uh, there are five different levels of damage. Damage level zero means that the site is fine, no problem. Damage level one, two, three, and four. And keeping a site at a high damage level incurs more cost. So these, these damages have to be repaired right away. The other may not be so urgent. And we have four agents, four robots, repair robots, that go around and they, they try to repair the damages. Now, the damage level of each side is unknown, okay? That's what makes the problem very difficult. We don't know what, how, how, how much damage there is in some site, except when we actually go there and inspect it. Then we learn exactly how much damage there is. Moreover, the damage changes all the time and deteriorates according to some mark of chain, some known mark of chain, unless the site is repaired. And at each time instant, the robots are at various places in the pipeline, and the control choices are two. Either inspect the current location and repair it if it's damaged. Now, repair takes one unit time. Uh, or inspect and then decide not to repair and move to a neighboring site. Perhaps one site, a site that requires more agent, uh, more urgent attention. Now the state of the system is just humongous here. It's the set of all the robot locations plus the belief state of the site damages. The robot locations and the damage, uh, uh, damage uh, states all together are something like 10 to the 30, 10 to the 40 states. Now, the actual state space is more complicated than that because it is the set of probability distributions over this 10 to the 30 states. It's just incredibly complicated and you can only represent it by some kind of a neural network, which is what we have done. Okay, so that's the problem. And what you would like to do is uh, the robots sort of split off and do intelligent things, go around and repair sites uh, and sort of divide their work. Uh, they don't want them to go all together the same location. So now I have, I have a video uh, that demonstrates different policies. One policy is the base policy, which is the shortest path policy. Each, each robot selfishly and without coordination goes to the closest damage site. Damage here is measured by having a certain reasonably high probability of being damaged, okay? Uh, then there's multi-agent rollout where we do one at a time uh, 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 policy improvement using the base policy. And then there are some signaling type of uh, policies. So I'm going to show you the base policy. Uh, Okay, I hope you can see them. And here we start with all the robots in the same location. 
they don't coordinate. So they do exactly the same things. They go all together, even though one of them is sufficient to, to, uh, to repair. Okay. So that's a not very intelligent uh, base policy. I'm going to stop it here at the interest of saving some time. Now, the multi-agent, uh, one at a time. OK, it starts from the same initial condition. And what we're going to see is that the robots fan out around the network. And uh, they coordinate. Uh, you say, I'm going to go to the left, and you go to the right, OK? Or go to the top, and go, I go, go to the bottom, that sort of thing. OK, so you see that they have split off, and they go, they go around different parts of the pipeline and they very quickly have obtained a much better cost and faster repair. Okay, now here's another one that's interesting. Here we use signaling. We don't use, uh, we try to, to parallelize the computation of the, of the, of the robots. Uh, and uh, we use the base policy for signaling. But then we have the same problem with uh, having group think. All of them try to do the same thing. And also they think that the other one is going to do something different, uh, but they end up oscillating. So this is really a bad, uh, bad policy. You see that <laughs> they can't, they just, each one thinks that the other one is going to go someplace else, but they end up doing all the same thing. So that's the kind of uh, difficulty that uh, this type of signaling has. And I'm going to stop it here. Finally, this involves approximating, representing this multi-agent rollout policy with a neural network and using it for signaling. And I'm not going to show you the video, but I'll show you the results. This one here, the base policy, took 30 steps and that much cost. The rollout was, as you saw, was much more efficient, took only nine steps and very small cost. The one that never stops, but oscillates, just uh, has a very large cost. It's not infinite because the cost is discounted here, but it's very large. And finally, with a neural network, we have the neural network uh, policy work fairly well. and. Uh, and uh, but not quite as well as the multi-agent rollout because it used an approximation to this multi-agent rollout so that uh, we gain parallelization through approximation this is faster once we have trained the neural network but it uh, but it, uh, it it gives you a higher cost so now let's see okay i have another set of videos where the agents start from different locations it's also interesting but okay, I think you've gotten the idea. The results are similar. I'm going to post the slides on the internet, and then you can make the runs yourself and uh, take uh, uh, take a look. Uh, uh, qualitatively, the same have similar results. The base policy, the rollout policy improved very much on the base policy. That's a general fact about rollout policies. They tend to improve even very stupid base policies. Uh, give you a very good uh, rollout policies uh, in, in, in most cases. And then depending on what base policy we use, we get something intermediate between the multi-agent rollout and the base policy cost. So I have another slide here, which does not roll out, but repeated rollout with approximate policy duration. And uh, this graph involves a problem, the blue problem, with eight agents, and the red problem with 10 agents. And the base policy gives you that much cost. The first iteration, which is the rollout policy, gives you something that's much, much better. And as you add more iterations, uh, you get improvements. Uh, of course, this involves training neural networks here. And uh, we get steady improvement uh, with, uh, and then we get a typical pattern where you get steady improvement for a few iterations, and then you reach a plateau. You even start oscillating, 
and, uh, and that's the way typically approximate polystyration works. So we have observed it also in this pipeline problem. Okay, so uh, let me give you my last slide. Uh, we talked about multi-agent roll out and polystyration. These are in the general category of methods that are called approximation in value space. And they can be applied to very complicated uh, reinforcement learning with multi-component controls. The case study I showed with multi-robot control is actually an extremely difficult problem, as prob even though it was represented on a planar graph, it's an extremely difficult problem from a dynamic programming point of view. So the key idea was simplified foreign policy improvement. There is a solid performance guarantee, namely the performance improvement property. And there's also another result having to do, another, several results that have to do with policy duration convergence. There's another result for value duration convergence and so on. So there is some theory here. And we have assumed a classical information pattern. Uh, the key assumption is the sharing of the perfect state information. However, we, show, we, we saw how we can pass on to non-classical information pattern problems by pre-computing signaling stuff, by pre-computing information that can be used by the agents to infer uh, information that they don't actually have. Uh, Now, back to the multi-robot repair problem, we have tried on that some existing methods. Uh, okay, these are software names, and I, I, these methods are approximation value space, but without rollout. They are sort of state of the art for POMDP problems. POMCP, one of the co-authors is David Silver of Alpha Zero uh, fame. MATPG is a, is a policy gradient method by a group from uh, Berkeley. So these two and this one are different. And Despot gives up with multi-agents because it just can't deal with the, with the size of computations, even with four agents. They cannot handle four agents. POMCP can handle up to four agents uh, in our context. And sometimes it works uh, better than the base policy. Sometimes it's even worse, but definitely much worse than uh, our methodology. MAPG does uh, crazy things, okay? Just works far worse than, uh, than, the, than the base policy. I don't know, but there's no theoretical basis for this method, actually. And it's no wonder that when faced with a difficult problem, it just goes insane. Uh, so here's an important research question. Uh, can we use this common state information, replace it rather, with state estimates, uh, pre-computed uh, guesses? And uh, the, I think there's a very broad range of methodological, algorithmic, and analytical questions that are ahead. We have uh, just uh, just made the first step in, uh, in this direction. Uh, and it's a new direction in the sense that we start from the classical information pattern and work our way towards the non-classical information pattern. Whereas other methodologies start directly from the non-classical information pattern and immediately are confronted with the great difficulties of that, uh, of that uh, structure. So I'm done and your questions are welcome.